You can watch Arsenal vs Burnley and Man City vs Crystal Palace on Now TV for just €10. Euro. So what's stopping you? Putting up more Christmas decorations? Your house already looks like Santa's grotto. A family party? Your Aunt Mary has seen you four times this week already. Don't let anything get in your way. To treat yourself to a Now TV Sky Sports Day Pass and watch the games that matter to you for just €10, Euro, search Now TV Football today. Content streamed by internet, full terms at nowtv.com. For an entire generation, people have experienced Star Wars the only way it's been possible, on the TV screen. But if you've only seen it this way, you haven't seen it at all. This is the podcast you're looking for. We've been waiting for you. The force is strong here, even stronger than the coffee. Welcome to Coffee with Kenobi. Here are your hosts, Dan Z and Corey Club. Hello, this is Corey Club, and welcome to show number 22 of Coffee with Kenobi, a Star Wars podcast that analyzes our favorite saga in a whole new way. With me is my good friend and co-host, Dan Z. Hello, everybody. We hope everyone has been enjoying our interview-packed summer schedule of podcasts. We have been able to talk with John Dag Morton, Tasia Valenza, Mark Dodson, and Jeffrey Brown, with much more to come. The response has been positive, and we appreciate everyone's continued support. The Star Wars community continues to get more expansive and exciting, and we are enjoying being a part of this wonderful Star Wars family. We are honored to be included on StarWars.com as one of the featured podcasts for all things Star Wars. We love what we do, and we are humbled and appreciative of being part of such an amazing group of talented shows. We also want to thank Jedi News UK and Full of Sith for continuing to support and drive listeners our way. We also have a few new bloggers coming your way soon with amazing insights and analysis on the Star Wars saga. Look for more information on this on our website very soon. Be sure to check out my appearance on the latest Talking Toys. We're a great fan of the show and Coffee with Kenobi blogger Jeff McGee and I talk about my new book, Uncanny Day. In today's show, we talk about the latest Rebels trailer, J.J. Abrams' latest video for Force for Change, meet the voice of the Inquisitor and Agent Callus, and discuss new Star Wars vans, as well as San Diego Comic-Con exclusives. Concetta Parker joins us for a quick cup to talk about the second annual Rancho Obi-Wan Gala as well. In our discussion segment... We share a cup of coffee with William Shakespeare's Star Wars author, Ian Desher. We're happy to have him on with us as we discuss the final book in the amazing trilogy, The Jedi Doth Return. This is Ian's second appearance on Coffee with Kenobi and features some terrific insight into his hugely successful series. We also have the next offering of your espresso shot with the bearded trio featuring Rob Wainfer. And now, let's see what's brewing in the Star Wars universe this week. Oh wait, this is interesting. You found something. Our first news story is hot off the press. The new Rebels trailer. It's the extended look. We learned so many things about this series tonally. See a little bit more about these characters. See a beloved friend from the Star Wars saga. What'd you think? The big thing here, I think for me, was seeing uh, James Donald Taylor return, um, if not just in a cameo appearance uh, that we see. That was the first thing the voiceover we hear, which gave me chills. Yeah. Um, it was confirmed by Lucasfilm that James Arnold Taylor was the voice of Obi-Wan Kenobi, which is unmistakable, truly. I mean, he's he's the quintessential Obi-Wan. I even tweeted from our account, this is the Obi-Wan we're looking for. And, and that, brings, <laughs> that brings an excitement. The thing about the Clone Wars that made it work right off the bat is we had so many familiar characters that we knew we were going to see, and it gave us much more complexity and, and layered them. Rebels is a much different animal. Mm-hmm. It's set in the universe that we know and the era that we really love and which built everything, to be honest, at least in my opinion. So we've got these characters we don't know, but the way that Lucasfilm has been marketing them and we're hearing about them, it just, I feel like these are characters that we're going to love for our entire Star Wars fandom or for our lifetimes. Absolutely, and I think too, it's uh, this was a really nice trailer. It really drew out kind of what we'll see probably. I would assume in the first episode, or first or second episodes, um, but also kind of give us a reintroduction of far the feel, like you said, the look and the feel of uh, how the tone of the um, series will be kind of told uh, from the you know, different perspectives. And 
Maybe not so much from you know the rebel standpoint as it is from the empire standpoint. Uh, I, I found myself kind of you know going back and forth on those two different issues as far as you know uh, you know who who has the most uh, cost here as far as um, you know uh, taking advantage of you know uh, the rebels as far as you know rooting them on and, and taking on the empire, but also the empire um, kind of flexing their their muscle, if you will. Yeah, what, when you say you notice some tones, what 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 did you pick up? Because I certainly get, we've been hearing for a long time that this is going to have an a real an original trilogy vibe. Mm-hmm. And if if you find yourself thinking, okay, well, what does that mean exactly? I think this trailer completely encapsulates that because you see the breakneck pace, you see chemistry, you see passion, you see this excitement and joy for the saga that really makes me thrill beyond belief i mean i've always been excited about rebels but when you see this you just feel like oh yeah this is home this is where we as star wars fans belong yeah kind of where clone wars was kind of um polished and clean if you will Mm -hmm. um this has grime to it i mean it definitely has episode four feel Mm -hmm. um it definitely for me um we have the tie fighter sound which was instantly a sound of episode four to me there's that blasting after the ghost ship there and uh, just in general, the little speeder bike chase and cool. um, being introduced to new characters, it feels it feels fresh uh, to me, and it feels like the episode four, like you know, let's, we're starting a kind of introducing these brand new characters to us and, and letting us follow along with the journey. And isn't it cool that even though they're new characters, don't you just feel like they've been a part of Star Wars for a long time? And maybe it is the marketing, maybe it's. Um, the Rebels visual guy that we were fortunate enough to get an advanced copy of it in peruse and just the way that Lucasfilm has been doing the things that they've been doing to spread the word but there's just so, there's sort of an electricity about this character, these characters which I think is hard to do and we've never really seen anything about them but they're nailing it. They truly are and, the, and again the voiceovers are, are dead on, they're, they're exciting, they're fun mm-hmm. and I think what, like you said, what kind of brings us kind of into this this new era and kind of gives us a nice rounded edge uh, as we leave the Clone Wars uh, saga that, I mean, I think hearing Obi-Wan Kenobi's voice really sold it for me. Uh, just hearing that, I was like, okay, this is part of this universe. This truly is for me. Uh, these new characters that are in this universe, I'm, I'm, I can't wait to see their backgrounds, uh, how they fit into the storyline and how they interact. And it, like you said, um, just it just it has that that familiar feel that we all are waiting for. And you need that connective tissue that Obi Wan yes. brings to everything. It's, it, James Ronald Taylor needs to be a part of Star Wars uh, forever, as far as I'm concerned. And it just gives that it's just a cool vibe. You know what else I really liked about this? The Tie Fighters, of course, are awesome. Um, I love. When it says focus your fire and there's a dramatic pause on the Jedi, I think we've talked about that before. But I noticed on this that I believe was lacking in previous incarnations of that scene is when he puts that lightsaber together, you kind of hear this click and whirl of of gadgetry and gears. It just gives it kind of a real world feel. Well, from what we know uh, from the character, um, he's hiding the lightsaber, so it's more of like yeah. a. It's like um, he's putting it together maybe for the first time or, you know, just to basically, you know, shine a light um, and and show that uh, he's there's Jedi still out there and continuing the fight. And um, it, it like I said, it gives you chills again. And it has that, 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 that Star Wars feel to it that makes you go, all right, let's do this. And isn't it cool? You know what I mean, though? That just that, that clicking. You don't, I never really thought of a, a lightsaber as motorized. I mean, it's like a laser focused through a crystal. As we saw through um, one of the episodes in season five of the Clone Wars, how they how they how they make their lightsabers, but it it gave it an, an a different kind of a feeling, more of a technology based feeling, more like real world stuff, which is how I typically imagine the original trilogy. More less of the, about the CGI and more about something practical. It just felt like a practical thing. Well, too, it's almost I mean, it's almost like. Uh he had it ready to be able to do that, you know, at, the, at a moment's notice, to be able to click it into place and be able to con- construct it uh, in the right time and, and maybe to reveal himself to the to the Empire and and give him that shock and, and awe feeling. And 
Um, it's it's a great scene, so I'm looking forward to more. It is. I, I almost I almost wonder how much of this is just in the first episode, but you kind of hinted around to that too. Hmm. Yeah, well, we'll have to wait and see. Our second news story has to do again with uh, the great charity, uh, A Force for Change, that J.J. Abrams is heading up. He did an excellent uh, little video uh, kind of introducing us again to uh, the charity and some, some new prizes we can uh, be able to, to donate to and uh, get in a chance to win. You know, T-shirts, uh, they got some posters, uh, all kinds of different, you know, signage and things like that. We've got... Um, Couple busts, some things, a script looks like a hilt, Star Wars hilt. The last two, the big ones. Uh, you want to explain some of those, Dan? Well, yeah. The, the big thing about this um, is they they keep adding different wrinkles. Like yeah. um, a few weeks ago, it was like if you join in now, you could win lunch with JJ Abrams. Which that's what yeah. that was the last thing that pushed me over the edge, and I and I didn't win that, as far as I know. Um, but the new thing now, the big hook is that. You can have a, a private screening of Episode 7 before anybody else does, and you get to invite 20 of your closest friends and family. Apparently, since they've done this, they've had contributions from over 119 countries. Uh, they just raised all kinds of money, uh, all Maze has, and it's just incredible what they're doing to help in these, these critical issues facing children around the world, you know, nutrition, water, health, education, it's it's so important. Um, sometimes we get so wrapped up in our lives. I know I'm certainly guilty of this, that we forget there's a much bigger world out there. And it's great that they can take Star Wars and add to that. But to me, the real news um, is the big reveal. And I'm very happy that I get to talk to you about this. Yeah. This is another thing where we didn't talk about this in advance. But what do we see in this video that's so awesome? It's the giant X-Wing. <laughs> Life yeah. size, man. Exactly. So tell me what that means for you. You are a designer. Put on your designer cap for a moment. Yeah. Anal- analyze the new X Wing. <laughs> I'll try. Um, you know, the first time I saw the video, the first thing that jumped out at me was that um, it had a blue stripe. Yeah. I'm just accustomed to seeing a red stripe or an orange mm-hmm. stripe, maybe if if you will. Um, the blue stripe kind of caught me off guard, but mainly mainly let me think of the X Wing book series uh, from Legends series. Um, I was like, "Oh, that's interesting." But I mean, have you read those? I've read a couple of those. Uh, really, they're actually I've, pretty good. They're kind I've of not like read a, one word of them, and I get want on to it. desperately. Get on it, but I, I think you know, seeing the X wing itself was incredible, and staying next to it, I was just like, "Okay, first of all, right there, it's a practical effect, right there in yes, itself." So exactly. And then, like like we've seen all along in the previous video with JJ Abrams, he's he's obviously saying, "Hey, hint, hint." Here's a little extra. Here's a little more. You know, here's one more step that we're you know going to put into the new movie, and and he's done a, they've done a great great job with this without doing too much, without giving away too much. You know, it's saying like you know here's here's what we're working on. Here's here's how it's going so far, without giving away um, uh, spoilers or character reveals or things like that. Um, but they do. They do give away character reveals in a sense. You know, you think about it. They had the real pelt walk on, kind of, again, using a little bit of comedy there. Um, the mouse robot. The mouse robot zipping by. And, you know, what does that tell you? Does that say Empire? Does that, you know, we don't know. Um, well, that, like, well, the mouse robot is only in, in A New Hope. But it, to right. me, it, it shows you this. There's just, like, real electricity in this clip because, mm-hmm. like you said, the practical effect thing. And, and I'm sure you noticed how much more sleek this X-Wing is. It's, it's much more aerodynamic. I was going to say, it's 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 sleek, and it's um, very um, it's awesome. unique look. I mean, it, it has that classic dirty look, yeah. which I know a lot of fans had said, you know, I hope they go back to that, that grungy, dirty feel, and not so much polish as we saw in, you know, the prequels. Uh, but I think that's the evolution of the, the, the story itself and where, you know, kind of where it's going. And it, it, it gets me excited because, like you said, it's practical effects, we're using X wings. Uh, we're seeing little mouse droids. We're seeing rural pilots in the orange, uh, and it's just exciting. I mean, and and all the people standing right there is, is JJ Abrams, directors, you know, coming out and saying, you know, support this cause, uh, and we're gonna give you guys some really great prizes and things like that uh, for, for a good cause, and plus we're giving you, you know, a little wet your appetite here, and I uh, couldn't be more happy. Well, how great is it that? It just hits me yet again. I feel like I say that every episode, but there's a reason for that. 
J.J. Abrams is such a great storyteller and he gets it. He gets the idea of balancing special effects with story and, and characters and the oh. chemistry. So he's just hitting us with all this great stuff. Is it possible to be even more excited for Episode 7? I feel like with every little thing like this that we see, and you can just imagine what the good folks at Lucasfilm and, and Bad Robot have in store for us marketing-wise and how they're going to build this excitement anticipation. It's killing me, man. It's just awesome. <laughs> Did you notice anything different about the X-Wing pilot's uh, costume? No. Did, did you see anything? Not that I could tell. Just kind of a quick one. And who knows if that's a part of it. Maybe that's sort of like, uh, you know, how they showed the puppet in the, mm-hmm. in the very first Omaze one. And who knows if that character will be in there or not. But we've got a new X-Wing and it looks tremendous. It's definitely something where, yes, when Hasbro makes it, I'm going to get one of those and put it in the <laughs> office because it looks awesome. Our, our next news story, I'm going to combine them because we've got sure. the last two reveals, as far as I can tell, about the new characters. We've, we've got Jason Isaacs as the voice of the Inquisitor and David Aiello as the voice of Agent Callus. The two big bads, as it were, to coin a just Whedon term. What kind of things did you notice about these two? Well, going back to the Rebels trailer, we do get to hear the Inquisitor speak briefly at the end. Um, Mm -hmm. Which we had. Which we had before, I think. I don't know if that was Jason Isaacs or not. It was. Well, you think so? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, Jason Isaacs, obviously a big, huge movie star uh, and obviously a, a great addition to Star Wars Saga. He's a presence, isn't he? He's a presence, and he's got that deep, kind of a throaty voice to him. Um, he's uh, got that awesome British tint. Of, yeah, exactly. I think you could probably do a pretty interesting analysis um, about the British versus the Americans and compare that to uh, the Imperials versus the Rebels. Hmm. And, it, and I mean, it, and the reason, one of the things that's the impetus for that remark is is that Mel Gibson film, The Patriot. Or Jason Isaacs is, the, is one of the lead British officers in the, in the main foil for that piece. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, Harry Potter. Uh, he's just he's a great bad guy. And, and when I saw that this was going to happen, I was pretty excited because he's, he is a major movie star. And he just has a certain gravitas. The Inquisitor, did you notice that Pablo Hidalgo said that they made a big deal about the fact that it's, he's not a Sith? Yeah, I saw that on the uh, behind the scenes there. Yeah. And it's interesting because, I mean, I kind of knew that in the back of my head. I wanted to believe that. You know, that he it wasn't, wasn't a Sith? Yeah, he wasn't a Sith, and he was more of a, I don't know, a hunter, if you will. Um, kind of, yeah. yeah Almost like a, like a Sithy bounty hunter. Yeah, kind of like, yeah, it's a good, that's a good way to describe him. Is Sithy a word? Sithy. <laughs> yes, it is now. Sithy. Full of, full of Sithy. Is that... No, that's that's a good that's a great Star Wars podcast. There you go. <laughs> well, yeah, he's he just again that gravitas and the Inquisitor, the way that they are marketing him in his look, which Dave Filoni describes in this video on StarWars.com. You needed someone with that kind of weight because, and I'm happy to hear, and which doesn't surprise me, they don't want a, another Darth Vader clone. They don't want a, yeah. a Grievous clone or a Darth Maul clone. They want somebody unique. I'm really interested and nothing has been revealed really too much about why he's not a Sith. I mean, we know about the rule of two. We know that Vader and Palpatine are the only two Sith out there. But of course, the Sith play pretty loosely with their rules as far as I can tell. They have a lot of, well, yeah, but this is just uh, my enforcer or whatever. Like, you look at uh, the Clone Wars and, you know, General Grievous had a lights, had a bunch of lightsabers, but he wasn't a Sith. Mm hmm. Yeah, it seems they seems to they I don't know if you could say call them higher, but they uh, have a lot of different dimensions as far as the Sith um, uh, hierarchy, if you will. I mean, mm-hmm. but it's interesting to see you know different backgrounds and different motivations. Um, and Ventress too. She oh wasn't, yeah, I was just gonna say Ventress you know. is definitely a great uh, person to, to label under that 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 heading, but. Um, and she's that's pretty much he reminds me of the the, the this Ventress kind of that that look that look and, and also I mean, they're different they're different like uh, species but yeah but similar in that you know that kind of bald dangerous swagger but he seemed they make a big deal about how he's calm 
He doesn't get angry, which, well, that clearly shows he's not a Sith because that's where a lot of the Sith get their power, too. Hmm. But there's just something about him that I instantly find captivating. Let's talk a little bit about Agent Callus. What do you think about him? I love him. I love David Ayala's voice. Um, the beard is awesome. I was going to say the chops. Yeah. Very 70s. Very <laughs> 70s. I think you and I should grow those for Celebration Anaheim. Let's do it. All right, I could probably do that in uh, in a weekend. I think the, the Wolverine of, of Star Wars. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Yeah, he's he's cool too. He's he's much more aggressive. Um, he seems like a real a real danger as well. That they're they're building this so that it doesn't become like the villain of the week sort of thing with the mustache mm-hmm. twitching, but much more about the fact that when these guys show up. It's going to go down, and it's really, really dangerous. So there's real peril for the Rebels, and we know that there's real peril for these guys because they're not in the original trilogy. Exactly. That's a good, that's a good point. And, I, my, yeah, my standpoint, Agent Kaos, he, he seems very, a very strong character, and I, I, I kind of found myself kind of drawing towards him in the, in the little updated preview we saw um, as just being a strong character and be able to command yeah. and, and just – Instruct and be able to looks like very um, military and very uh, dynamic in his structure of taking down these little cells of, of rogues. So it's so World War II. It just in yeah, the, yeah, that's true. And the oppression in the in the clip we see, we're kind of going back, but to the the second trailer for Rebels, mm-hmm. the way the stormtroopers bully and harass people of Lothal, it's it's pretty heavy stuff, man. And again, now we know that it's going to premiere in October for sure. It can't get here soon enough. Our next story kind of has to do with um, Coffee with Kenobi ourselves a little bit. Like we mentioned before, we're uh, the start new StarWars.com website debuted a couple weeks ago, and we are graciously uh, recognized as a podcast on their uh, community page. And, uh, you know, we couldn't be more happy and excited. And along with that debut, we also debuted a brand new uh, Coffee with Kenobi logo, which kind of reflects our growth as a podcast uh, of kind of a streamlined design of, of, of our mixture of our uh, old version and uh, something we call into to kind of, I don't know, kind of liberate a little bit, uh, if you will. Um, I designed it myself, uh, obviously with your input, Dan, and we went back and forth on numerous versions just to get it, just to tweak it just right. And um, I think we got something we really like and it's really vibrant and orangey. It is orangey. <laughs> I think that's one of the things that is I orangey love a word? about it. It is. It is like okay. Sithy. Yeah, well, that's that's true. That's true. Right. Well, it's it's very very fun. I think we spend more time probably on our logos than we do anything, <laughs> and that's saying something because we put a lot of time to this because it's a labor of love. And in well, Corey, you said it perfectly. It's a huge honor to be included with Fangirls Going Rogue and Far Far Away Radio, the Force Cast, Full of Sith. Now this is podcasting, Radio One One Three Eight, Rebel Force Radio. Star Wars Bookworms, the Star Wars Collectors Cast, and of course the Star Wars Report. They're great shows. Just to be included with them and to know that our labor of love, which is Cough with Kenobi, is on StarWars.com. It's just it's just wonderful. I, I feel very blessed. You've written a couple blogs for the official blog, um, as it was in, our, in its old incarnation. And now as we if they as they come out with the new design so far you're featured a feature blogger so talk about that a little bit it's crazy man yeah now i get to be a feature blog contributor for starwars.com this is this is my fanboy dream and <laughs> i get to look on there and, and i'm just very happy it's just really fun the the good folks at lucasfilm who i work with when i got to be a part of this it's awesome it, it's just the same thing it's this is just something that we love to do it shows fans that star wars and lucasfilm are reaching out to fans and it's not all about you know just the franchise itself I mean they they incorporate fandom in such a variety of ways if, if you just scroll on that, down that community page uh, there are numerous different avenues of fans want to get involved in different things they can go to that community page and click on something they like to do and find new fans and new friends out there just doing the same exact thing as they like to do exactly it's really really neat it, it still blows my mind just being able to contribute to these amazing writers in this awesome community. So definitely check out my blogs on StarWars.com and all the other great bloggers and honored to be a part of it. It's just a wonderful experience. Dan, can you talk a bit a little bit about maybe the, some of the topics you do plan to, to hit on? Yeah, I, I, what I'm going to focus on is, of course, education. And I want to look at Star Wars as a piece of literature because it really is film literature and 
kind of bring some of the analysis we do here on the show into the blog. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Sounds great. And now let's join Rob Wainfer as he pours your espresso shot with the Bearded Trio. And now your espresso shot with the Bearded Trio. Welcome to another espresso shot with the Bearded Trio with me, Rob Wingfer from thebeardedtrio.com, bringing you the latest news on Spielberg, John Williams, and George Lucas. First, I want to say congratulations to Coffee with Kenobi for being one of the featured podcasts on the recently designed official Star Wars website. I feel honored to be part of the great team. Thank you, Coffee with Kenobi. If you haven't checked out the new site yet, head over to starwars.com to see their sparkling new website. Let's play the T-Rex because it's Jurassic World news. The cast of Jurassic World gets bigger every day as another addition has recently been announced. James Dumont has joined the cast of Universal's Jurassic World, according to Hollywood Reporter. Dumont most recently played Sherman Adams in The Butler. He can be seen next in the James Brown biopic Get On Up, directed by Tate Taylor. Uh, he will play Corporate Dooley in the film. Steven Spielberg may not be directing Jurassic World, but the love of the Dino franchise is still very close to the director's heart. Colin Trevorrow, the director of Jurassic World, which is set for release in 2015, admitted he is getting words of wisdom from Steven Spielberg. When asked by Hollywood Reporter if he's getting any advice from Steven Spielberg, Trevorrow told the uh, Hollywood Reporter, words of wisdom every day. You'll send ideas and you'll draw out ideas on pads of paper and then I'll shoot it. So there you go, Steven Spielberg still involved in uh, the next Jurassic Park movie, even if it is just a tiny bit. Now, thanks to the website on locationsvacations.com, it seems we know that there's going to be a scene set in an airport in Jurassic World. Uh, the filmmakers have arrived near, near the Louis Armstrong New Orleans International Airport, and they've been there since June the 26th. Readers of the website have reported that they have seen signs for Ebb Tide, the working title for Jurassic World, the Jurassic World's equivalent to Blue Harvest, if you like. Now, the website says, based on a few recent casting calls we found, production is filming in an airport arrival scene in the New Orleans area today. So don't expect any di- dinosaurs roaming around a terminal just yet. And that's your Jurassic World news. Now, good news for Spielberg fans. Universal Studios are releasing the Steven Spielberg Director's Collection on Blu-ray on the 14th of October. Now, this will consist of eight memorable Steven Spielberg movies in one neat, handy collection. Four of the movies have never made it to Blu-ray before. Now, the movies are Duel, Sugarland Express, 1941, Always, Jaws, E.T., Jurassic Park, and Lost World. Now, the first four in that list are new to Blu-ray. They've been digitally remastered and contain hours of bonus features, including making of documentaries, interviews with Steven Spielberg, behind-the-scenes featurettes, rare archive footage, deleted scenes, and a whole lot more. So mark your diary for the 14th of October. Now, season four of the Spielberg-produced Fall in Skies has started in the US and opened with a healthy 4.7 million viewers. Now, compare that to episode one of season three, uh, which opened with 4.2 million, so it's already up on last season. The show is by TNT and is aired in the US on Sunday evenings. UK viewers have to wait, though, until 15th of July, where it will be shown on the Fox channel. Be sure to tune in for Fall in Skies season four. Jim Nelson, the veteran sound editor and post-production guru who helped put together Industrial Light and Magic for George Lucas to create the original Star Wars, has sadly passed away at the age of 81. Nelson, whose real name was James M. Falkenberg, and he died on June the 18th, his family announced in a paid obituary in the Los Angeles Times. Jim also worked on other movies such as Birdman of Alcatraz, Exorcist, and another George Lucas movie, American Graffiti. 
And sadly, another loss to report is Terry Richards, who played the swordsman from Indiana Jones, has passed away. He was also 81. Richards' career spanned 50 years, appeared in films such as James Bond, Star Wars and Rambo, and he also doubled for Donald, Donald Sutherland, Tom Selleck and Christopher Lee. Richards served in the Welsh Guards before being told by a friend that they needed extras with military training. He was asked if he could fall from a scaffolding, which ultimately led to his long career as a stuntman. Harrison Ford, at a 30th anniversary screening of Raiders in 2011, said, I was no longer capable of staying out of my trailer for more than it took to expose a roll of film, which was about 10 minutes, and then I would have to flee back in for sanitary facilities, said Ford. He added that Richards, who had trained and trained for the role, was disappointed to lose the chance to show off his newly acquired sword skills. The Cairo swordsman did get his own action figure, and has even appeared in Lego form. His family revealed that he died suddenly on Saturday the 14th of June. Chicago has officially been chosen as the site for George Lucas's art museum. Now called the Lucas Museum of Narrative Art, the city was selected over Los Angeles and San Francisco as the future home of his collection of art and movie memorabilia, according to a spokeswoman for the museum. The city offered up a slice of real estate along the Lake Michigan shore that is near other attractions, including the Shared Aquarium and the Field Museum of Natural History at the same time. The Lucas Museum, which will include pieces from Lucas's personal art collection as well as Star Wars memorabilia, is expected to generate up to $2.5 billion in additional tourist revenue for Chicago over 10 years. So congratulations to Chicago. (coughs) Well, that's it for another espresso shot with the Bearded Trio. Before I go, I must tell you about the beer cans that Narragansett are doing. Remember that scene in Jaws where Quint crushes a can in front of Hooper? Well, now you can relive that scene thanks to Narragansett beer. They've come up with this fantastic idea of bringing back the beer in their 1975 retro design cans. The same design Quint got his shark smelling hands on in that Steven Spielberg directed movie. So now you can enjoy a beer and pretend to be Quint at the same time. Find out more at naranganzetbeer.com. Well, that's it from me. Keep up to date daily on the Bearded Trio at thebeardedtrio.com. If you want to get in touch, then you can t- contact me by email, rob at thebeardedtrio.com. And man, we're also on Twitter and Facebook too. Just type in the Bearded Trio. Thanks for listening. I'll hand you back to Coffee with Kenobi. I'll see you soon. Goodbye. Han Solo, Rebel Soldier, Lando Calrissian, and Bespin Guard each sold separately from Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back Collection, new from Kenner. Looking? Found someone you have, I would say, hmm? Your lightsabers will make a fine addition to my collection. Our first news story for our collector's segment, uh, we have Conceta Parker here to join us to discuss the second annual Rancho Obi-Wan Gala. And Conceta, this is clearly, since it's the second annual, this is the second time around, uh, Corey and I were not able to go to the first one, and sadly not this one, but our fingers are crossed for the future. And the reason our fingers are crossed is because it's a pretty amazing event. Can you tell us all about it? It is amazing. And thanks for saying so. Absolutely. You know, I, I, it's, you know, I, we always talk about it and we talk about Rancho and how amazing it is, but it's always nice to hear other people say that. (laughs) Um, and if you can't make it this year in person, you can still buy a, uh, you can still buy a ticket to the second annual Rancho Obi-Wan Gala and, you know, to help it it all benefits Rancho Obi-Wan, you would get the amazing swag bag. And then you're, you also get an absentee ballot that you can, you'll be able to bid on items in our live and silent auction. So it's basically, you know, in simple terms, it's a big party. It's a chance for everybody to come together, uh, at Rancho Obi-Wan. We have dinner, there's music, we have dessert. It's all hosted by Steve. Um, amazing door prizes and uh we do the bounty hunt of course there's always vip guests and um you know special celebrity appearances and you know last year we had uh james arnold taylor Catherine tabor dave filoni tom kane darren hayes from savage garden uh you know randy martinez and denise vasquez they performed um as well as james arnold taylor and i mean it was 
and you're in this, you're at Rancho. It's the home of the world's largest Star Wars collection. And even though we had well over a hundred people there, it's still, wow. it's a very intimate experience um, at Rancho for anybody that's, whether you've seen the pictures or you've been there, or you've heard about it, you know, just, I don't know, the, the community of Star Wars and you get everybody there for the same reason and you're there to celebrate Star Wars. That's what it's all about. And we have absolutely amazing people, um, artists and companies that donate items for us to be able to provide in the silent auction and the live auction. And, and Steve actually, um, he is our, he, he runs the live auction. So watching Steve, <laughs> announce all the items and you can see in his face. I was like, he wants to bid on that. So we, we did, a- we did actually have somebody bidding for him on a couple of the items. Um, but it's, I mean, it was just, it's fun. It's really a unique, you know, I could just say, Oh, it's a great big star Wars party, but it's so much more than that. Um, and we're super excited about it. Tickets are on sale now. And and we, we just had a big meeting about it over the weekend. Hmm. So looking at my notes right now, but I can't really divulge a lot of the information, but I can say it's exciting. <laughs> so we will be um, announcing, obviously, as we get closer and, and actually very soon, since tickets are on sale now, some of the items that will be featured, uh, the people that are going to be donating those items. And if anybody has anything that they would like to donate to Rancho Obi Wan for the auction, they can always contact our director of development, Rich Smolin. His information is on our website at ranchoobiwan.org. Um, but I've seen the list of a lot of people that have donated, and it's pretty it's it's pretty awesome. Like last year, we had you know work from Brian Rude donated, and Jerry Vanderstelt, and Katie Cook, and just a ton of people. Big names. Big names, Sideshow Collectibles, you know, DK Publishing. I mean, it's just anything from small to large to everything in between and autographed items and things that show up last minute where you're just like, ah, you know, and uh, watching everybody get excited about it. We had like a, a prototype IG-88 model head Whoa, cool. that turned out to be one of those that things that Everybody wanted it, including <laughs> my husband. Oh. Like I'm, I'm with, I'm in the green room with um, uh, the Clone Wars cast, and I, 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 we hear shouting, you know, from inside the museum of people laughing, and they're like, "Oh, a bit higher, a bit higher," and I'm like, "What's going on?" It's like, "Oh, you're there's a group that's going back and forth." you know, bidding on the IG-88 head. And I recognize, I was like, is that my husband's voice? I think it is. <laughs> um, but it was. <sighs> did he get it? No, no. I, I'd be a whole lot more happier if he did. But it was great because, you know, all, all the, the proceeds went to benefit Rancho. And he was super bummed, as was I, once I really got a good good look at at the item. But it went to a good home. Good. And, and, and we know <laughs> <laughs> that's, I could just sit here and babble. I say that's incredible. I, but talk to us about the planning stages. Maybe um, you know, you guys obviously uh, had a good year last year. Do you, when do you start planning, and, and how do you start? Uh, you know, making sure it's even bigger and better this year. That's a really good question. We actually had a meeting the day after <laughs> the um, our our benefit last year, which was yeah. our world record night. That was, you know, awesome and very successful. And we were so thankful. Um, so we we started brainstorming the next day. There's actually a couple of pictures, I think, of Ann Newman, the manager of Rancho, and my dear friend of her and I laying on the floor, <laughs> <laughs> like just kind of you know, trying to take notes. There's post-it notes, and we finally were like, Steve, Steve, let's, you know, relish this this moment and and take a minute. But we were already trying to think of things because you know, yes, people get excited about Star Wars, and but as we all know, there's so many new and exciting things, especially lately, mm-hmm. about Star Wars to get excited about. Um, so it's like, how do you kind? Of, you know, do we do we try to pick a theme? But how do you when there's so many awesome things going on within the universe of Star Wars? So um, it's an overall celebration 
party. Um, it is, you, you do have to be 21 to attend. Uh, we have some uh, fabulous, you know, there, there's food and drinks and a lot of what I always like to, to let people know is because yes, we're, it is a fundraiser and none of the money that is ever raised or donated or anything that comes through for memberships is ever used to purchase any Star Wars items. It is solely um, for the costs of maintaining Rancho Obi-Wan you know, insurance and security and utilities and maintenance so that we can make sure that the preservation documentation and the protection of that collection goes on well beyond our generation. So um, that's why it it, it is so important. And the support from the fan community is just fabulous and greatly appreciated. It's extremely important for posterity, uh, for nostalgia, for the for the history of everything that's going on with this incredible place, and the amount of care and passion that you all put into it is contagious. I think. Just, I already wanted to go really bad, and now it just makes it even worse <laughs> because it just sounds just so fantastic. <laughs> um, okay, so Consetta, I'm sure you can't uh, tell us what's in the the swag bag for this year, but what was in it last year? Oh, goodness. Okay. Um, let's see. Everybody, there was uh, the Steve's autographed card that went into everybody got a copy of the uh, the Guinness World Record book. Cool. Uh, that was that Rancho Obi-Wan was featured in. We have um, and we'll have this year as well. I, I can tell you we'll have the the special limited edition T-shirt with the logo for the gala events. Basically, anything that's going to be in the swag bag that has the logo that's special for this event will only be available at this event. Um, so we had, you know, last year we had the collector patch and the challenge coin and trading cards. Uh, we had artist uh, Lee Kosi actually uh, drew hand sketched trading cards individual for every person that was there while they were there. Everybody got wow. something personalized. Um that's amazing. It, and it, it and it was amazing to watch and people get so excited and because you saw it happen before your eyes and then you have it. And then there were people that were trading things. You know, we had the bounty hunt, which last year was for the trading cards that you could then gather and, and, and you got the whole collection of the specific trading cards for the event. And uh, there were different plushies and action figures and uh people were trading and it was fun it was kind of like a mini convention in that in that sense and it was like oh and it was kind of like christmas morning because everybody got their bag (laughs) which the bag itself had this you know the special guinness world record logo on it and it was also a collectible and people opening them up and looking to see what they had including me Mm -hmm. because i didn't know what was going to be in my bag and you just it was it was just fun like we genuinely had so much fun and whether you were a fan or a, an artist or a donor or a board of director or talent, um, a VIP, everybody was there for the same reason and really enjoyed it. And it was just, again, that, that sense of, of community and camaraderie and just enjoying that, that is star Wars. And that's, you know, the, all the common, the common factor among all of us, um, regardless of how old you are or where you come from or how you grew up, everybody loves Star Wars. It brings people together. And, and how many other places do you know where you have that kind of an intimate gathering and you can rub elbows with Star Wars celebrities and people who pour their heart and soul into their professional life as well as into their private life? So I think that's – it's pretty cool. It's, it's like it's like Star Wars celebration but even more intimate. Uh, yeah, I think that's an interesting way to put it. And like one of the highlights last year towards the end of the evening, Tom Kane, who is fabulous, he um, he was there with his son and they had a rental car. So he's like, oh, I'm going to run out to the car. Well, he had brought in pictures to autograph. So he sat down and just started signing free autographs. Wow. Um, you know, and most and pretty much anybody that was there, if you wanted them to sign something, take a picture, everybody was, you know, certainly doing that. So it was just, you know, it was, there were no, there was no like segregation. You're very much amongst friends. And 
I think that's one of the messages that we, that has, has come from Rancho and that it is a safe place. It's what the Star Wars community needs, especially now when we need to combine our, our strengths and our passions together for this saga that we love so dearly. Right. And celebrate that everything that it's, that it's done and given to us or, you know, those of us that have been, you know, the first generation fans, Mm -hmm. the the generations to come. And certainly there's things that people disagree on and have their differences. And that's all, you know, part of the galactic pot of things, but Mm -hmm. you can't help but be at Rancho and just smile and, and enjoy that, that feeling of connecting with your childhood, just being happy. Um, you know, being able to talk to other fans, meet new, new friends, new, you kind of leave with new family members um, because we do consider ourselves family at Rancho Obi-Wan. And I think that's, you know, Star Wars as a community, I think has a very family feel to it that we're all in this together. So it's like a, like a galactic group hug when you're at, <laughs> when you're at Rancho. There you go. There's, there's the slogan for the next year. <laughs> I was going to say, Dan, yeah, I say, Dan, year three, we should save our pennies and, and head out there. So that would be awesome. It'd be really awesome. I, that'd be, I wonder how far of a drive that is. We'll have to start mapping it out. Start, start right now. Road yeah. trip. There you go. Road, that would be awesome. We could. Coffee with Kenobi Road trip. That's right. <laughs> that would Rancho give bust. <laughs> 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 Very cool. Well, um, so tell our, tell our listeners where they can go to get tickets. Uh, and is there a deadline? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, you can, you can go to rancho obi1.org. Um, that's where you can buy tickets. And it's, um, right now the, if you're a rancho obi1 member, you can purchase, uh, you can purchase tickets. So you can log in basically to the member store and get your tickets now. Um, let's see. We, had a special, but that ended last week as far as $50 off of the admission. Mm. So right now the admission is it's $250 uh, a ticket. And we don't we, we don't have a deadline just yet uh, for when the last day is that you can purchase a ticket. So right now it is open, but the tickets are going fast. I bet. Yeah, they are. And again, even if you're, because, you know, we have a lot of people from overseas and around the world that are like, oh, we can't go, but you can still purchase the ticket. You still get the swag bag sent to you. And again, you get the the absentee bidding ticket where you can then bid on items that will be featured in the silent as well as the live auction going on during the event, Um, which was fun because we had board members with, you know, Collectors, everybody knows uh, uh, Duncan Jenkins and Gus Lopez, both board of director members that were handling like the the Collins and uh, the people out of town and overseas that were bidding on items. So it was kind of neat to watch that because you see that kind of thing on TV, you know, where people are bidding and you got the numbers going up and you're placing bids uh, on behalf of somebody else. And that was interesting to watch. It's great. And I guess we should probably mention, what is the day of the gala? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm just think, assuming everybody knows. I know. I did, it just hit me on that. I wonder if we said that. <laughs> we are looking at Saturday, September 20th. And it is, it's a seven hour party. It's fabulous. Wow, it's from awesome. 4, 4 p.m. until 11 p.m. And there will be fun activities throughout the evening. Uh, and you never know. What's going to happen? Who's going to show up? And again, even last minute items. And very soon, 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 which I will keep everybody posted and obviously we'll be sending out media alerts. We will be announcing things that will be featured. Um, Any celebrity guests that we are allowed to announce ahead of time, but I dropped some hints last year. I think people kind of knew. It was just (laughs) awesome. it, It was fun. Yeah. And certainly, you know, if you have any questions anytime, Go to RanchoObi1.org uh, and, you know, it's easy to contact and ask questions. You can always email info at RanchoObi1.org. Follow them on Twitter, too. That's right. At RanchoObi1. And Instagram, RanchoObi1. And Facebook.com forward slash RanchoObi1. Yep. So many great ways for everyone to get in touch with the ranch and to find out more about this incredible event. 
Conceta, thank you so much for joining us. We wish you the best of luck, and we'd love to have you on after the gala is over and discuss all the exciting, amazing things that happened. Ah, that would be awesome. Thank you so much, as always, for you guys, what you do and your support. It's greatly appreciated. Our pleasure. Happy to do it. The next item of collector's news has to do with some more apparel from uh, the van company. Uh, Star Wars fan shoes, if you will, uh, are coming out. Um, looks like they're debuting during San Diego, San Diego Comic Con. Uh, yeah, the next wave of them. Yeah. And they've, they've had, I think, of some previous incarnations. Is that right? Yeah. In fact, uh, um, one of our, our bloggers, Troy Metzler, who's also our San Diego mm-hmm. Comic Con contributor, he's got a couple pairs. Um, and they're showing they're showing some images of the ones that are going to come out in the fall. Uh, which ones kind of hit you? Because I I don't own a pair of van yet of vans yet, but I'm going to and see if you can guess which one of the new designs I get. <laughs> well, I, I will say from an artwork standpoint, it's interesting. Um, a very uh, pop culturey looking. Uh, very yeah. um, some of them almost look like a design you see Warholian. Yeah, Andrew yeah, Andrew Warhol. Yeah, I up a word. Is that, doing that a lot? Yeah, us. three now. But yeah, very, uh, very interesting. And very, um, I don't know, retro a little bit to them, a little bit, kind of like the, that feel. They have lightsaber shoestrings, which are kind of cool. Yeah, um, I love that. Yeah, the ones I think you would pick. Um, hmm, I'd say you go with the hmm, the at at design. Boom. With the orange and blue, and it looks look tropical a little bit. Well, it's got you've got the at at and the snow spear, but snow it's speeder, got yeah. palm trees. It's just it's awesome. <laughs> it's kind of uh, like a reverse of Hoth, it's, yeah. Exactly, and it's kind of slick too because if if you didn't know, you'd just be like, oh okay, what kind of shoes is oh, he wearing? Yeah, flying but, the radar there, yeah. But it's cool because it's got two things. I'm a big fan of palm trees in Florida and that kind of thing, and of course the at at snow spear doesn't get much better than that when it comes to Star Wars. So. Those are the ones I want. I've been looking for those. I've asked so many different people in the in in uh, journeys and places that sell vans where the at at one is, and they're always looking at me like, "Who?" Huh? So now, <laughs> um, now I realize it's the reason that they're not out yet is because they're not out yet, and that was yeah. part of the original release that the vans had sent us a few months back. So I believe these hit on October first. They're going to see again the previews of them at Comic Con, and they're going to give, they're going to give away posters and things like that. So October first, Dancy's going to go get himself that selection for sure. Some new kicks, right? New kicks, brother. All right, our final piece of collector's news is StarWars.com on their blog is is showing the exclusives checklist. So many things uh, that pop out the Acme archives. We'll have a link to this in the show notes. We got a jersey, uh, cool stuff with Luke Skywalker, of course, R2KT, uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, the big one I'm going to guess is the the six inch Jabba with the salacious crumb and the in the dais that we've been talking about mm-hmm. on a couple of shows. Um, what's the what's the one for you that? If you could get one, what are you, what are you interested in getting? You know, uh, I'm, as I scroll down on some of the stuff, it's pretty awesome. I just uh, I'm always awesome. amazed at all the stuff that they just incorporate Star Wars with. And they've got the, the hats. They got, like, say, the Jabba Black series. How about those floor mats? Different color. <laughs> different colors. They're a lot today. of fun. Yeah, they're really cool. I mean that, and they got that look. Definitely check out the the Hot Wheels Star Wars vehicles. Those oh, that's are awesome! The They're that's so the sleek looking. And then, the, of course, the box that it comes in is almost like a like a little mini lightsaber. Con- Isn't it great? Or whatever. They've just done a great job with z- the release design designs they're having with, with uh, the Hot Wheels stuff. And then the other thing that caught my eye was the uh, uh, the Yoda, the little diamond select. Uh, Spirit of Yoda, a little figure bank. It was interesting because I'm a, I had a Spirit of Obi Wan Kenobi from I want to say a cereal box. Um, Power of the Force, I think it was. No, yes. I think say it was. that again. It was from a cereal box. It was a uh, uh, Power of the oh, Force. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, Obi Wan Kenobi, sure. Ghost, Ghost Obi Wan Kenobi. You need to mail away for it and. I had one of those a long time ago. I thought this is so awesome. I'm probably the only one who has like one of these. And then I went to <laughs> WizardCon in Chicago 
and there was some dude that had like literally a whole case full of them. I was like, dang. So, but this is interesting. Uh, again, there's numerous things on here for fans. Like I said, there's jerseys, there's uh, figures, there's um, all kinds of stuff. Um, yeah. I'm interested in the the floor mats. I think they're awesome. They're, I mean, they're fifty bucks. I mean, that's a little overpriced. But you have but Star. Oh, you have Superman Star floor mats to, at the time being, right? I do. I had Batman, then I went to Superman, and now when I see a Stormtrooper <laughs> that's blue, that's ah, really blue. really cool. Well, Wednesday they've got gray, Thursday blue, Friday red, Saturday pink, and Sunday green. <laughs> there you go. Get a red one and a pink one. There you go. I'm sorry, a red one and a green one. Uh-huh. Merry Christmas, Stormtroopers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not actually usually I'm all about the black series um, but I'm sort of hit and miss with some of these but that lightsaber case with Darth Vader car all like you said yeah. those Hot Wheels cars look fantastic so I'm really hoping to get my hands on one of those but we'll see we'll see you know you know how quickly those go and yeah. sometimes at, at Comic Con it, it gets a little hectic from what I've been told so we're going to hope for the best and uh if you do get one, make sure to send us a, a tweet or a Facebook or send us your pictures and we'll share them because they look like they're going to be a lot of fun. Absolutely. Hello, this is Ian Desher, author of William Shakespeare's The Jedi Death Return. You're listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z and Corey Club, and this is the podcast you're looking for. <laughs> Luke, you're going to find that many of the truths we cling to depend greatly on our own point of view. I must be allowed to speak. You've taken your first step into a larger world. Our topic for show number 22 is Ian Desher and his William Shakespeare Star Wars series. How has this series enhanced your appreciation for the Star Wars saga? How has Ian's work impacted your enjoyment of Shakespeare's work? What can we learn about the Star Wars universe through William Shakespeare's Star Wars, The Empire Striketh Back, and The Jedi Doth Return? Joining us on this topic is friend of the show and author of the William Shakespeare Star Wars series, Ian Desher. Welcome, Ian. Thank you, Dan. Absolutely. It's well, so much has happened uh, since we had you on a, a little over a year ago. You're one of our very first guests, and William Shakespeare Star Wars had just come on the scene and was blowing up the New York Times bestseller list, and people couldn't wait to get their hands on it. And it's just been an incredible journey for you. What has this whole experience? A William Shakespeare Star Wars saga been like for you? Uh, it's been crazy, honestly. It's been a, a wild two years of sort of learning about uh, learning so much about the publishing industry and having these three books come out, uh, and uh, just having so much fun meeting people who have read the book, getting to Skype with classrooms like yours, uh, nice. with students who are working with the book. Uh, it's just been a huge joy. It's been a joy for us. My my. My freshman, I mean, obviously it's the summer, but the entire rest of the school year, they talked about it all the time, and they would tell me that they put their posters up of the books in their room, that the Quirk Books was kind enough to send our way. So it's been really, really fun. I, I, lo- I think I, I sent you a message after you were in my classroom. A bunch of kids said to me, oh, is, is he your best friend? <laughs> <laughs> Only and the correct answer is yes. That's right. There you I go. Said yes. I think I said yes, um, but not – but. Except for my wife, of course. Right, right, sure. That's right. So, Ian, uh, what has been the biggest change of the series with uh, Jedi Doth Returns, your newest release? Uh, just in terms of, of writing it and it getting the series is kind of maybe a whole. Yeah, uh, I mean, with the third book, we we, you know, there were sort of it was really fun with these books because they sort of snowballed, right? So, so in the first book, I set myself up with with. Uh, a handful of sort of conventions and rules that were basically self-imposed. I mean, obviously there's the iambic pentameter and, you know, things like uh, the books being in five acts, just like a Shakespearean play and scenes ending with rhyming couplets, things like that. Um, And then in the second book, I added in things like Han and Leia speaking in rhyming quatrains to each other when they get romantic, Um, Yoda speaking in haiku, Boba Fett speaking in prose. Um, And then with the third book, you know, it was, it was, really fun then to sort of figure out, okay, what are we going to do with the Ewoks? Uh, you get to introduce sort of a, uh, a foil to R2's, fo- uh, R2's fool in the person of salacious crumb, Jada, Jabba's sidekick slash pet or whatever he is. Um, and uh, <laughs> so that was really fun. And, and uh, you know, you get to play around with Admiral Akbar and 
you know, I have all of his lines ending with a word that rhymes with trap uh, because of his <laughs> his famous line in the in the in Return of the Jedi. So uh, it was just it was just so much fun to you know uh, again all these sort of self imposed rules that I put on myself uh, and really especially with Empire and Jedi I was just asking myself more and more okay what what can I do that's just kind of ridiculous right what can mm-hmm. I do that's just kind of uh, just kind of silly and is going to make people just get a kick out of this and so you know again you get things like the Rancor singing, uh, which, you know, uh, <laughs> never really expected the Rancor to sing, but, but there he is singing away as he chases after Luke. It was, it was great. And it, I, I really truly believe, and I'm not just saying this because you're on the show this, I really think Jedi Death Return was my favorite and they're all amazing. They're all books that I'm, I'm proud to own. And, but I just really enjoyed how you came full circle with Jedi Death Return. Thank you. It was really fun. And I mean, one thing that was, I mean, besides the fact that Jedi is really probably my favorite movie of the trilogy, um, really having to do with the fact that I was, it was the movie, first movie I saw in the theater. Uh, when we, when I was a kid, I had the making of a saga on VHS and, and which I watched all the time and which was kind of about the making of the whole trilogy, but was really focused in on, on return of the Jedi. Um, and of course had all the toys and all that sort of thing. And so mm-hmm. it just has a, a soft place in my heart. And, and then to really be able to get into, the characters, not only the whole Java sequence, which I love, but also really get into Luke and Darth Vader and the Emperor in this third book uh, and just sort of see what's going on for them uh, in their minds, what they're feeling, especially with Darth Vader, you know, sort of starting off being sort of confused about his son and then eventually deciding to save him, uh, you know, is just so, so much fun to to uh, to explore and, and to dig into dramatically. Yeah, uh, speaking of Darth Vader, he's such a strong uh, character in the series, and we especially see it in Empire Strikes Back or Return of the Jedi. Uh, how did you get into the head of this famous Sith Lord, and how much guidance did you have with, with Luke's film? And you said just kind of went off script a little bit as far as the Rancor, but as far as Darth Vader, how much guidance do you have from, from their end? Yeah, that was interesting, because actually in the, in the first book, uh, I wrote it sort of when Governor Tarkin announces his intention to uh to fly to Alderaan, you know, to to threaten Leia uh with with its destruction. Um I had written a monologue for Darth Vader where he's basically saying um you know expressing some not necessarily regret but just sort of a little bit of unease with going and killing just innocent people. And Lucasfilm uh read that and said, "No, as of Star Wars episode 4, Darth Vader is still totally bad. He would not have any bad feelings about going and killing innocent people." So I took the soliloquy and I turned it 180 degrees around and and had him, you know, say, I mean literally the first line had been uh the death of innocence brings me no joy and I changed it to the death of innocence doth bring me joy, right? So uh, <laughs> yeah. and it changed the whole speech, right? So um wow. so it was fascinating that they had that perspective. They know their characters so well. Um, but then you have to figure that by Jedi, he's starting to have these, these strange feelings, you know, c- coming up and, and, uh, and there's this, you know, I mean, the scene where, where Luke sort of finally hands himself in uh, and you have Darth Vader in a setting that he's not in really in any of the other movies. I, I mean, I guess barely in Hoth uh, for a moment in Empire, but but he's he's almost never sort of among nature, right? And here you get Darth Vader on Endor and Luke coming to him, um, and uh, you know, and they they have this almost tender scene, right, where where uh, you know Darth Vader tells him it's it's too late to to save me and uh, and that sort of thing, and it's it just just it was just really great to you know, play around with that and, and, uh, and think about, you know, what must he be going through right now? He's, he's had this life that has treated him so terribly. And this is where I, I really do, I have to say, you know, have, I have an appreciation for the prequels and sort of the backstory they give us, if nothing else, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you, you realize here's a man who's just had an awful life. He's finally found, you know, this path forward in, you know, his ob- obedience to the emperor, uh, but now there's this total wrench being thrown into his plans with this this son who you know you you can imagine right would would remind him of this life that he he'd led before. Mm-hmm. Well, I like that you mentioned the idea of Darth Vader and and when he's finally around nature, it's on indoor, and even in that, he's still in a sterile environment because he's above uh, with the adats. So it's like he's walking that dichotomy of who do I want to be, and of course Luke's 
helps them to figure that out, which I think you captured beautifully with these soliloquies. And in the review I did, um, I mentioned the scene where Luke is about to leap into action above the Sarlacc pit, which to me is a quintessential example of how you have personally combined classic Shakespeare and Star Wars. So how do you walk that line so beautifully while pleasing both genres of fans? Because they can be very different. I mean, I don't know. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think I told you before, when I first heard this, I was like, oh, man, I hope I hope they nail this with Shakespeare. Because this is Shakespeare, because I am I do love both genres very much. But you, you hit it out of the park. I mean, I think part of it is is, you know, Shakespeare would never – keep you guessing about what somebody's feeling. And True. he had such great insight into sort of hum- the human soul and human motivations. I just I just saw a production here in Portland recently of Othello and was reminded once again just how much I love the character Iago. I mean, who's just so so bad. Horrible. Yes. So bad. Um and but Shakespeare just just does this I mean, it's just a marvelous portrayal of a person who knows exactly the evil that he's creating and and plays everyone around him uh to to sort of make what ha- what he wants to happen happen um and it's it's brilliant and and anybody who has been around somebody who is i mean maybe not quite that pathologically evil but but still i mean we we all know people who uh you know who scheme and are and are not you know not trustworthy at all and, and yet sort of put on this veneer of it and I mean, he, he hits human emotions so well and, and sure he doesn't, I mean, he's not, again, he's not subtle in terms of letting you wonder what a person's thinking. He'll, he'll just have them give you a soliloquy and tell them and tell you exactly what's on their mind. But, um, but I think that's part of the, the strength of it. So, I mean, I guess, I guess I hope that in the Star Wars versions of, of the, the Shakespeare Star Wars that I wrote, that I'm sort of helping to give sort of some new life to Star Wars by, by, sort of pulling the curtain back and showing it, letting us all see what's inside, what's going on inside these characters. You definitely have. And I'm curious, um, as you've been promoting these books and going through this whirlwind of an amazing experience that you've had, uh, through Lucasfilm and through the star Wars saga, when people come up to you who are not necessarily star Wars fans, but they're passionate about Shakespeare, what kind of feedback do you get? I mean, the, the Shakespeare slash theater people have all been really tremendous. They, they, I mean, they appreciate, I think, the uh, sort of imitation of Shakespeare that I'm trying to do and the, the attention to detail that I've tried to include in, in these, um, uh, you know, in these books. And I was just at a, in Boulder on, uh, over the weekend and uh, a man was there in the, at the reading that I did, uh, who is right now in Henry the fourth part one in, in the Colorado Shakespeare festival. Um, and he came up to me afterward and, and, you know, was just, uh, you know, we, we were just sort of t- chatting Shakespeare and, and, uh, you know, he appreciated sort of the, you know, he was, he was the one sort of sitting in the back, like giggling at the Shakespeare references as I, as I was, <laughs> you know, reading and, and that sort of thing. And so, uh, it's been great. I mean, and like, I mean, there are always, there are critics on both sides of the aisle. There are the Star Wars critics and there are the Shakespeare critics. And the Shakespeare critics are the ones who are saying, well, this is clearly not Shakespeare, right? It's clearly not up to Shakespeare's genius. And I, I could not agree with them more, right? I mean, uh, I, don't, I don't claim to be Shakespeare. And, and you know, I, I do think that when you pick up a book called William Shakespeare's Star Wars, you probably expect a, a certain not Shakespeare-ness to it. But, uh, but, but by and large, people have been really supportive and, and wonderful. Well, and, uh, and uh, well said. And on that same token, people who are huge Star Wars fans, I don't know if, if you um, pay attention at all to Star Wars weekends, but they used to have a hyperspace hoopla where at the end of each night of Star Wars weekends, a lot of the Star Wars characters would come out and they would dance to popular music um, that was on the radio or on iTunes at the time. And, and a lot of people got their feathers and ruffle over that because they don't want to see their Star Wars characters melded into that. Now, with William Shakespeare's Star Wars, I don't think that we have anything close to that. We have complete reverence for these characters, and you're psychoanalyzing them in a way, because as you said, Shakespeare was not a stranger. Or he was not shy, I should say, about revealing how these characters feel. And you take this, and I really firmly believe that you have added new dimensions to these characters as far as how we look at them and what motivates them. And I think that is something that Star Wars fans uh, 
are applauding. Well, and that's and that's the hope. I mean, you know, in the end, I want us all to be able to have a, have a laugh with these books and and enjoy them. And yet, I do hope that I'm I'm shedding some light into you know what was Darth Vader feeling? What was you know just how bad? What's motivating the Emperor? Uh, you know what's what's Luke's experience of going through this? What's Leia's experience of being told that she has a brother and that Darth Vader, who blew up her home planet, is her father? Uh, you know, all these things. And you actually uh, talk about that, which I've never seen Leia really discuss. So I appreciate that. I, I have to admit to to being. Uh, <laughs> Inspired by Robot Chicken Star Wars uh, <laughs> and, and their portrayal of uh, Princess Leia after when when she and Luke are in the Millennium Falcon escaping the Death Star after Obi Wan's just been killed and she says to him, you know, oh, I'm sorry. Did the old man who you just met died? I'm too busy thinking about the millions of my friends and family who were destroyed on Alderaan. You know, and it's <laughs> clearly there's there's some grieving going on for her there. <laughs> I'd like to say too, uh, along with your stellar writing uh, and, and collaboration here, uh, the books are full of incredible illustrations as well. What are your some of your thoughts on those? Nicholas Delort, who is the illustrator, uh, he's a mm-hmm. Canadian who lives in Paris, and he just did an amazing job melding uh, this, you know, sort of bringing the Elizabethan style to bear on our favorite Star Wars characters. Um, part of what I love about his illustrations is they help us really imagine what these could look like staged. Uh, you know, the, in the first book, he has these wonderful drawings of, during the Death Star battle where he has the the ships sort of on, you know, marionettes almost, you know, to sort of give, give an illustration of how you might, uh, how you might actually have seen this on an Elizabethan stage. Um, the picture of Admiral Akbar in The Jedi Death Return is worth the price of admission itself. Uh, I mean, it is just, is when I saw his picture of, of Admiral Akbar, I just about died. It was so funny and so perfect. Um, he has, they have him in sort of this uh, 19th century British naval commander's outfit. I mean, it's just, it's just hilarious. Um, so I, I really appreciate the work that he, uh, that he has done. Uh, I I will get to meet him later this year, so I'm excited about that. It's, oh, it's, excellent! It's funny to be doing a project with somebody you know, and and you've never met them before, uh, so it'll be fun to to meet him in person. That's very cool. And and what I love about that is that it almost has like a sense of realism. Like you could suspend your disbelief and sort of imagine these uh, books being put on as plays for uh, Elizabethan audiences. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it it. it does really sort of strongly suggest to you. I mean, some some of the pictures are are sort of iconic Star Wars moments, but others of them really look like, wow, this is almost like it's a drawing of a stage production. Exactly. And Dan speaking to me about his his review and, and uh, his his enjoyment of the the book series, he talks about the the translation of the Ewoks, uh, calling it brilliant and hilarious. Uh, so, what kind of response have you gotten uh, from that, and, and as well as the book uh, in general? You know, I think the Ewoks are the, those characters that Star Wars fans kind of love to hate. Uh, I, you know, I think uh, of anything in the trilogy, those the Ewoks may be the the things that people kind of roll their eyes at a little bit now, which is funny. I mean, as a kid, I loved them. As an adult, I can see how, okay, it's kind of a cutie teddy bear kind of thing, but I still <laughs> enjoy them, right? Uh, and and so their their language, you know, what I did basically was took their original dialogue, again, sort of one of the fun things about working with Lucasfilm is that they sent me their official transliterations of all of the foreign languages in, uh, in the movies. Uh, so I, I had, you know, Ewokies sitting in front of me and they're, the, they're the original words from the, from the movie. And, uh, and so I took those and then, and then gave the Ewoks these sort of four line patterns with an AABA rhyming scheme. Um, and, and almost, and then almost like a pigeon English, right? So, uh, so that wicked when he, when he, uh, meet Princess Leia says, ah, buki buki, looky looky, it's a creature, nuki nuki, right? And <laughs> I hope that people enjoy it. I, I mean, you know, people people laugh at it in the readings, which I don't know if it's because I'm up there making a fool of myself uh, or because they think it's funny. Uh, you know, the, the more I've read it out loud, the more I wonder if if the pidgin English really, really works uh, the way I, I'd hope to. I almost, I guess what I'm saying is I almost feel like spoken it's a little bit too obvious when you're reading it on the page i think it has the right balance of of like looking like nonsense and then you realize hey wait a second i can almost kind of understand this um 
That's yeah. why it's brilliant to me. And I, when I was reading this, I would actually laugh out loud, which I don't often do when I'm reading something, even if it's funny. And my wife would say, what is this? And I would say it to her and she looked at me like I was crazy, but I'm used to that when I talk about Star Wars and I, I loved it. And to me, the Ewoks have been sort of replaced with Gungans as far as a lot of people kind of casting a wary eye at, yeah. but, but I think it is pretty clever how you did that. Uh, that was one of my, my favorite things too. I, you know, the, the different ways that you've taken all these unique characters like Yoda, Boba Fett, the Ewoks and taking Shakespearean language and kind of put a twist on it. I think that's fun. And that, was that something that came from you or was that something where the editors were kind of pushing you in a certain direction? No, those were, those were things that came from me. Um, uh, like with Boba Fett speaking in prose with, with the first book, I thought, I actually thought seriously about having Han Solo speak in prose again, because, you know, Shakespeare mm. used prose as sort of to represent the lower classes. Uh, and, mm. and, if anybody in the first movie would be considered sort of among the lower classes, who's a main character, it would be, it would be Han. Um, but two things, first of all, I love Han Solo and, and didn't want to, you know, denigrate him. Uh, right. and second of all, in the first book, I did, I also didn't want to sort of be accused of being lazy and with my iambic pentameter and, and, you know, switching over to prose. And so I kept iambic pentameter out, you know, throughout the whole thing in empire. I, I decided, okay, I've, you know, I've proved I can do iambic pentameter, so now it's it's okay to have a character who can speak in prose, and who better to you know represent the lower classes than you know this vile bounty hu- bounty hunter? And also, he's become such a beloved character, uh, Boba Fett has that you know to to take his speech and do something different with it uh, made made a lot of sense as a way of sort of calling him out. And he has he has way more lines in Empire than the, in Empire Striketh Back than he does in the movie, um, which is you know again because once you realize a character is uh, is popular, you want to sort of give them more more airtime. Um, but that was all; those were all decisions that um, that I made. We did; con- I did consult when it came to Yoda and sort of what to do with him. Uh, well, and with the Ewoks, uh, but with Yoda, I, that was one where I sent off to Quirk Books and off to we sent then off to Lucasfilm. Sort of my different ideas uh, surrounding surrounding what we were going to do with Yoda. And, and we had actually sort of, you know, decided on, on another direction um, before I had the idea to have Yoda speak in haiku. Um, and then I was, it was right around that time. And I was uh, on a morning jog and, and had the idea to have him write in haiku. And I knew as soon as I had the idea that it was a better idea than any of the others I'd had. Um, so, so, and as soon as I emailed it over to, to Quirk Books and to Lucasfilm, they all, they all agreed. So, uh, so those were all, all sort of things that, that, you know, came out of my head one way or the other. The inspiration. Yeah, I love that. So I can't have you on the show today, and I'm sure there's – you're probably you're not allowed to say very much, but what can you tell us about the Jedi Doth Return's ominous ending? Because there are definitely some strong hints, my friend, that I feel like there's some foreshadowing there. Well, and and the honest the honest truth is, yeah, I mean, so so for those who may not know what you're referring to, in the end of the Jedi Death Return, I gave R two D two sort of the last the last word, and he comes out sounding like uh, you know Puck in a Midsummer Night's Dream, and mm-hmm. um, and has this this sort of rhyming, you know, rhyming set of of words, and he hints at what might be coming next. Uh, he refers to what maybe even could be the title of a movie, Empire Rising. Uh, you know, and then in the end, he says, uh, thus present I our conclusion, hint of fate or fool's illusion. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and basically, the, the true story there is that is that Quirk Books thought it would be fun to hint at episode seven uh, in the end of, of Jedi Death Return, uh, you know, sort of as though we had insider information. The truth is, I have no insider information. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I wish I did, but uh, uh, it was just sort of a, a fun thing to uh, to throw in there. And then, of course, uh, for those readers who who may not catch it, the other sort of Easter egg there uh, in that speech of of R two D 2s is that it's a, an acrostic, which is a uh, uh, you know a poem that is, or I guess poem that's created by uh, you know, or I guess it's when the I'm not explaining this well. It's when the first the first letter. letter first letter of each line of a poem spells something out. Uh, and so the first uh, letter of each of his lines in that speech that he has spells out episode seven cometh. 
Um, so uh, it was it was really fun to to do and to write and to uh, sort of. I have had people who have you know been contacting me on Twitter, uh, you know, and saying, "Wait, do you do you know something?" <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that. No, it's, I don't actually know anything. <laughs> that's funny. Kind of kind of a, a last moment for R two to just sort of say, you know. I'm a lot wiser than you might have thought right away. I, I, I'm the pulse of what's going on here in the saga. Exactly. I'm still in charge. That's right. That's right. What can we look forward uh, from you in the future? Uh, any more Star Wars books or anything of that nature? Uh, it's possible that there will be uh, more William Shakespeare Star Wars. The, the true answer is that I don't know yet uh, mm-hmm. what I'm going to be doing next. Um, uh, the prequels are being talked about episode seven is being talked about. Nothing is, is final at this point um, or decided at this point. Um, I'm also working on uh, uh, another couple of other things that are not star Wars related. Uh, I'm actually working on a, uh, uh, a little collection of uh, verse, you know, that would be sort of uh, sort of around the theme of fatherhood. Uh, Just fun. Mm, uh, Fun sort of, sorts of poems and actually i'll uh, i'll share one of those with you uh if uh, oh, sure you'd like me to that'd be great all right so uh here this is and this one will be uh especially appropriate uh for uh for coffee with kenobi so this is titled to my son who refuses to hate jar jar binks <laughs> here it goes please know that i'm trying the best that i can to raise you and make you an awesome young man i first showed you episodes four five and six the order is important these aren't merely flicks Together we talked about every last thing that makes the original trilogy sing. We stayed up as late as your mother allowed. You loved every minute, and I was so proud. The monsters and battles all gave you no bother. You didn't flinch when you heard Darth as Luke's father. It seemed you were ready as ready can be to learn about episodes one, two, and three. We sat down together to start them one day. I waited to hear what your keen mind would say. What sounds of confusion or words harsh and mean would come when the Gungan appeared on the scene. But dad, I imagined, why is this guy here? Will they kill him off soon? Will he disappear? Why show him so soon once the movie begins? And why does he sound like the Olsen girl twins? And isn't his character somewhat offensive? The racism is making my heart apprehensive. (laughs) But none of those words came across your two lips. Instead, and with this, I'm still coming to grips. You smiled and you grinned and your, your face started to beam. I couldn't believe it. I wanted to scream. You laughed. Oh, you loved him, that horrible creature. And still you declare he's the movie's best feature. Now, history may say that I am to blame for this reprehensible, terrible shame. But how could I know what would happen that day, how you would be led so completely astray? So maybe I shouldn't have done what I did, but you are my Padawan, my awesome kid. And maybe what happens proves this declaration. Those movies belong to the next generation. Together we'll share these great films, you and I, and I'll try to watch with your innocent eye. To my son who refuses to hate Jar Jar Binks, I love you despite your opinion, which stinks. Wow. That, that was that incredible. That is fantastic. Yeah. That encapsulates everything that needs to be said about the different generations of fans. That's great. Thanks. So so we'll see. I mean, I, again, I have no idea what's going to happen with this uh, this collection of verse, but uh, but I'm working on it now. And ha- obviously, I hope it, you can tell from that, uh, having a great time with it. You know, the <laughs> first, thing it, first thing that popped in my mind was the, the old Charles Silverstein, uh, well, Sidewalk Ends books, oh, right? Oh, yeah. I read, I've always read, uh, my parents read those to you when I was a kid. I've read some of those to my kids, and so it was an excellent uh, foray into that, 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 that style. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, man, I can't wait to see what, to see what you've got in the, in the future for us. Very, very cool. So uh, uh, we, we reached the end of the three uh, the original trilogy of William Shakespeare's Star Wars. Um, people are probably dying to ask you all kinds of questions if they haven't already. And based on uh, Mr. Verified by Twitter over here, I'm sure that's happened a lot. So where can people get in contact with you? So I uh, have a website, which is uh, iandesher.com, I-A-N-D-O-E-S-C-H-E-R.com. The O throws people off. All the time. Uh, I'm also on Twitter at Ian Desher, uh, facebook.com slash author Ian Desher. Uh, and that's, and on, then on the QuirkBooks site, you can find the books there as well. And they also have those great uh, teacher guides too. And you're also a, an important part of Star Wars in the classroom. That's right. Uh, so uh, I've, I've joined up as one of the rogues on uh, Star Wars in the classroom. So uh, I am enjoying that 
that community as well. Uh, and it's been fun to put together the educators' guides, as you mentioned, uh, that are on the QuirkBooks websites uh, or website to, uh, to uh, for any teachers out there who are thinking about using these in the classroom. It's definitely the way to go. And, and one of the rogues I know is using them heavily and and helped to design some pretty exciting things uh, for William Shakespeare Star Wars. There's so many educators who've, who've come up to me and asked me about this and just showing all the resources that you and Quirk Books have put together is, is really exciting pedagogically as well as uh, just as a fan. Well, and it's been really fun to do and I'm, and, and I'm thrilled that there are classes that are using it. I will even say um, I had my, uh, my son will usually come in and look at some of my Star Wars stuff I get and he picked up the Empire Strikes Back and he, he's like, oh, this is a cool picture. And I kind of drew him in. He started opening it. And he walked away with the book. I didn't see him for the last, next 20 minutes or so and, until he, I found him on the couch looking through it. And he's a pretty good reader. And, I mean, obviously, he's been introduced to uh, two great franchises and two great uh, writers. So uh, congrats there. Oh, thank you. That's, that, I love hearing stories like that. That is very cool. That is very cool. Talk about taking your first step into a larger world. <laughs> yeah, he was, yeah, he liked it, so. That's awesome. Well, Ian, thank you again so much for all your support of the show uh, over the past year and the great work you've done for the Star Wars saga and for fans. Are you going to be attending any more conventions or San Diego Comic-Con or, or hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, Celebration Anaheim? Celebration in Anaheim? I'm not sure yet. Uh, so I'm, I'd love to be, uh, and it's, I'm, I'm just not sure yet. That would be awesome. Well, if that happens, we'll definitely have to buy you a cup of coffee. That would be great. I'm ready. Absolutely, man. Well, thank you again so much, and uh, enjoy your continued success. It's it's certainly well deserved, and uh, we absolutely look forward to everything uh, coming from you in the future. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks, Ian. Our topic for show number twenty three is Star Wars Rebels. What are you looking forward to with this promising new series? What have you thought about the trailers and the official news so far? Which characters resonate with you at this point and why? What themes are you starting to notice based on what we've seen so far? Joining us on this topic is friend of the show and author of Star Wars Rebels, The Visual Guide, Adam Bray. In 500 words or less, be sure to send us an MP3 or an email with your thoughts, comments, or opinions for us and Adam to feedback at coffeewithdomi.com. I like the sound of that. Echo 3 to Echo 7. Ah, nobody, do you read me? I saw part of the message. I seem to have found it. Our first email comes from writer Waldron, and he says, Hey guys, great show about Disney and Star Wars. Your interview with Aaron Harris reminded me of when Mark Hamill came to my college when I was an undergrad in the late 90s. I usually tried to avoid going too crazy over any celebrities that usually disappoint me, but Mark Hamill was great. I had to skip a couple classes to get in front of a front row seat, but it was worth it. He spoke for about an hour and afterward still to had time to post for pictures for everyone that wanted one. It's easy to be a fan of people like him. A couple more things. I have to agree with Dan that Pacific Rim is one of the worst movies ever made. <laughs> Sorry, Corey. If my eight-year-old son had insisted we finish watching it, we would have turned it off after ten minutes. But I stuck it out and only got more painful. However, my son loved it. He has now been placed for adoption. He's only joking, folks. It's unbelievable that a sequel is being made. Also, Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull is a great movie. I think I need to invest in more Coffee with Kobe t-shirts to wear Look for the upcoming Salt Lake Comic Con. I think you guys will need to host a panel at it also. Thanks, Ryder Waldron. Well, Ryder, um, I will disagree with you on this comment. I mean, I, I, I like Pacific Groom. Dan and I always, always kind of go back and forth with this, and certainly everybody's welcome to their opinion. But maybe I'm just an eight-year-old kid just living vicariously through, you know, fandom and just enjoying giant robots, slug out aliens. But, you know, I enjoyed it, and, you know, it's not maybe not for everybody. And the Crystal Skull was, eh, it was okay. I mean, I don't necessarily. When's the last like, time you watched it? Didn't we talk about like this? It was like two Ed? months ago. 
It was not two I months ago. I guarantee you, two months ago, I watched I, Crystal Skull you again. You didn't say anything. Because Ed also told me to, and I do whatever Ed tells me to do. Well, so. you should. He's a smart man. <laughs> As his writer, I mean, look at this. He, he, he agrees with me about Pacific Rim and Crystal Skull. He, he knows what's going on. In all seriousness, <laughs> it's cool to hear that other people have had nice experiences with Mark Hamill. Um, as far as the Coffee with Kenobi t-shirt to wear for the upcoming Salt Lake Comic Con, that sounds really fun. As far as us hosting a panel, we don't live anywhere near Utah, although that would be awesome. I would love to uh, get to a point where we can go to more cons and help to spread the word. So, Ryder, we appreciate your your well wishes and uh, your optimism. We certainly hope that someday that can be a, a reality. And definitely say hi to uh, Brian uh, Young at the Salt Lake Comic Con. I'm sure he'll be there hosting some kind of panel. Our next email comes from Mike Arrigan, and Mike writes, Hey guys, love the recent show on the Disney-Star Wars relationship. I look forward to future Star Wars attractions at the Disney parks. The thing I notice about Disney parks is that there is always the centerpiece, an eye-catcher that anchors the park. The Magic Kingdom, for example, has a castle. The Animal Kingdom has the Tree of Life. I believe Walt Disney called these visual icons weenies, and I'm just going to interject here. The reason he says that, and, and I don't know it exactly verbatim, but the basic principle is that when Disney was designing Disneyland in the early 50s, um, the idea of training like a dog or a wiener dog, I believe he had, to lead him around, he would use a hot dog, and that would be like a visual eye catcher for the dog to stimulate it and to lead it where he wanted it to go. So this is the explanation behind the term weenie here. It's not junior high stuff, folks. What do you think would make a good Star Wars weenie? Star Wars is difficult in one respect because some of the best potential weenies are dark side icons. The Death Star would make sense, but it was an instrument of destruction. Also, I had the pleasure of interviewing Brian Young on my own podcast regarding his new book, The Serpent's Head. We began talking about Star Wars at 28 minutes 30 seconds and mentioned Coffee with Kenobi at around 32 minutes 30 seconds. Thank you for having him on your show recently. Here's a link to the episode. Thanks, Mike Arrigan. And Mike, thank you. And we will certainly include that link in the show notes. And thanks for bringing us up. It's a real pleasure. Of course, Brian is an awesome friend of the show, as are you for all your support uh, over the past year. But yeah, there's got to be some sort of an icon if they do, in fact, follow through with the Disney Star Wars relationship in the theme parks. I know a lot of people were concerned that they were going to take Spaceship Earth, which is the centerpiece of Epcot, and turn that into the Death Star. I hope they don't hmm. do that, only because no. I think some things should stay the way that they are, and the Disney iconic nature of that needs to stay intact. But there's a lot of potential there. They already have one at Hollywood Studios with the ad ad. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we talked about this on our episode uh, with Ricky. With Ricky Brigandi, and we talked about you know some of the attractions we'd like to go walk through and experience and. I certainly, the first thing that comes to my mind was a Millennium Falcon. I mean, that's iconic yeah. enough uh, to be able to serve as a center point. And, I mean, I I can't think of anything else other than maybe a giant Darth Vader helmet to really, <laughs> you know what I mean? Just something that just, like, you instantly see that's, you know, a Star Wars oriented and that's uh, worldly known. Um, but, yeah, I think somebody having something like this as, as a, a centerpiece to a Star Wars theme park or a Star Wars land, if you will, uh, it would be great. I, I like the idea. A Yoda tree? That'd be kind of cool. That, that would be cool. Pop, just popped in my head. Yeah, a yeah, Yoda tree. Or, although they've yeah. already got a tree with the Animal Kingdom, like That's Mike true. said. But it is a cool idea, the, the concept. Of I'm not sure what I'd like to see. I, mean, I, I agree the Millennium Falcon. That, that would, to me, would be the ultimate eye catcher. That would be the thing that would draw your attention. That'd be awesome. Some sort of a Death Star thing would be cool. Of course, it could not be to scale because... <laughs> that would not, I don't think I think that would be pretty hard to maintain. Well, like you said, to make um, the Epcot uh, is it globe there, the, the spaceship Earth, the spaceship Earth into the Death Star would just kind of just take away um, the credibility that it's already built up such you know over the years that it's just it's an icon in itself. Yeah. Now, now you could drape over some fun things and enjoy it for Star Wars weekends. True, you know, I think that'd be kind of cool. cool. But yeah, um, like yeah you don't want to take away from that. The ambience of, of that, that centerpiece. So Yeah, you want to add, uh, not exactly. through subtraction, but just through um, quality. Our next email comes from Robert Coleman, and he says, Love the show. Listen a lot of time. Do you guys have t shirts with the logo? 
And if so, how can I get one? Well, Robert, we are in the process of putting together uh, an online store. Uh, I think it's safe to say that uh, we're still in the works. But, um, you know, we'd like to put out new T-shirts, the new logo, and have that vibrant orange really kind of, you know, shine a light out there for us. Um, and different, some other merchandising items, um, you know, maybe, you know, uh, I want to say maybe a coffee mug would be uh, definitely one we were looking at. Um, maybe some, I don't know, earrings. Earrings? Sure, why not? <laughs> earrings or possibly, um, I don't know, a glove. A glove? But just uh, one, like you buy one single glove. Obviously. Did you watch a Michael Jackson documentary? No, I was thinking, I was thinking uh, Luke Skywalker, Ember Strikes Back. Oh, yeah, he now. wears a glove in that too. Well, it's a robot hand, but yeah. Anyway. Smooth criminal. Shoot us your ideas of what maybe you'd like to see the new uh, Coffee with Kenobi logo on. And uh, if you're interested in a shirt, uh, you know, let us kind of know on, the, on our Facebook page or our something on Twitter and let us know how, how excited you are for it and we'll get some things rolling. Our next email comes from Sean Reed and he writes, Hey guys, I just recently discovered the show back around episode 18 or so and I've really been enjoying it. You guys do a great job. I wanted to briefly respond to the listener who submitted the MP3 on episode 21 discussing the status of the EU in the Legends line. I'll admit to not being very familiar with the EU. I grew up in the time of the original trilogy, and for years, those three films and the assorted action figures were my Star Wars. I've recently begun to dive a bit into the expanded universe and have added a few of the old Dark Horse comics to my collection. However, I've been a longtime comic book reader, and I'm very familiar with the issues other characters have had with regards to continuity. I've survived the crisis on infinite Earths, zero hour, identity crisis, etc. And I'm just going to add in that that is, of course, DC Comics. Back to the email. It seems that most of these attempts to reboot or simplify continuity only manage to exacerbate the problems they're trying to solve, which seems to be a similar affliction that the EU is suffering from in regards to reconciling the various continuities and canons. So to that end, I can see why Lucas and I presume Disney felt the need to bless a particular canon over another. If they're trying to establish the brand in a particular manner, then it makes sense that they want to make sure that the stories all follow a pattern of their design. As I thought about it, the notion of the brand is perhaps what makes this issue with what is and isn't canon so problematic. My Bachelor's of Arts is in English, and I chose to spend quite a bit of time focusing on medieval literature, particularly Arthurian legends. The interesting thing about King Arthur is even when most people accept as canon, isn't really canonical. Arthur's roots are in Wales, but the story most folks know best are actually from the French writer, and I will do my best to not butcher this, Chrétien de Troyes. Even going back to the original Wales, you find a few different versions of Arthur, a rotating cast of knights who made up the round table, and at least two very different Merlins. I've not counted all the variations, but suffice to say, Crisis on Infinite Earths has nothing on King Arthur and his knights. I love King Arthur, every version of him. Amusingly, when the BBC show's Merlin aired, I shared it with a fellow medievalist and noted that it took liberties with some of the stories. He quickly noted that meant that the show is basically following in hundreds of years of tradition, new canon is the canon. This is kind of how I view the decisions with regards to the Legends line. King Arthur is a very important figure in the history of Britain, in particular the history of Wales. In many ways, he is a revered savior figure, sort of a progenitor for our modern heroes, Superman, Luke Skywalker, etc. However, the lack of a strict canon makes Arthur a more interesting character. He's no less of a national brand than any of the other heroes that make up our blockbuster movies today. But that doesn't mean that there is an understanding that all stories about Arthur are locked into a specific canonical structure. All that to say, sometimes the stories of our heroes are best left unencumbered by the modern and often artificial expectations of canonical structure. I actually think canon often hurts character development by placing limitations on the types of stories that can be told. Granted, there are, and I contend will always be, certain inalienable aspects of our heroes, but the ability to take them in different directions without accounting for years of backstory can create a richer story, giving us a much more robust hero in the end. After all, it worked for King Arthur. Thanks for taking the time to read my reply. May the force be with you, Sean Reed. Well, Sean, awesome. Love hearing from our English majors out there. I like the parallel with Arthur. We do a pretty uh, in- fun thing in my classes with King Arthur, and there are so many different versions of him 
Uh, it's kind of similar to Greek mythology, and Star Wars is certainly our modern myth too. Um, so I agree with again with the notion of why they had to take the expanded universe and, and make it a legends category so that they are unencumbered by what they want to do with the future of the saga. So it's an interesting counterpoint. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I don't know a whole lot about medieval uh, times and as far as um, Arthurian legends, and but I can see what he means as far as you know taking that a story and and kind of you know letting different directors or uh, creators kind of roll their own versions out. You know, may it, may, it, may it be you know Merlin or something of that regard. Uh, it, it, there's been different arc- incarnations of far as films, uh, books, things like that. I mean, just as we talked about before, the the Legends series um, is is just that. I mean, it's playing in that sandbox, uh, like we talked about, and uh, it's certainly um, kind of for me. It's kind of kind of found its own right. It's found its own place uh, in my fandom uh, as uh, wonderful stories to be able to pick up and enjoy. We, like we talked about earlier, you can pick up the X Wing series and just enjoy it. Uh, and read up on uh, some, you know, different characters, uh, different storylines that might that may may have happened uh, according to that author's version of it, and uh, certainly wouldn't, you know, want to uh, not be able to include those into my fandom because uh, it, it's, it's it's part of something that we all love and uh, be able to enjoy and expand on. Our next meal comes from Monty's Rose, and they say, "Hi, y'all! I admire the podcast. Great work." Uh, Monty's Rose is the editor-in-chief of RestaurantFiction.com and the host of Restaurant Fiction. Uh, the, this month's review is on the Moss Isley Cantina. We thought it would make a great bathroom read for you guys. Uh, find it at uh, RestaurantFiction.com. That's from Monty's Rose. Uh, we love supporting all kinds of different podcasts out there and uh, different uh, variations of, of Star Wars fandom. Uh, so definitely check us out. We'll put a little note in our notes section um so go check it out our next email comes from friend of the show laird malamud of the indie cast and he writes dear dan and Corey, as always thanks for the amazing podcasts thoughtful conversation and sharing of your fandom with all of us and the great t-shirt design which got a thumbs up from one of my teammates the other day well, that's awesome as and he's referring to our our original logo i believe i return to the email As a lifelong Disney fan who has grown up and still lives within an hour of Disneyland, the true original Disney park, I've been more times than I can count. When Star Wars came to the park via Star Tours in 1987, it just seemed natural. I went within a few days of its opening, and when Indy came a few years later in the Temple of the Forbidden Eye ride, I got to go to a preview night, and I was blown away. It was the best way to experience a Star Wars adventure. I was still in college, and luckily in winter break when it opened. When I worked at Lucasfilm a few years later after grad school in 1991, I found the sound reels with the sound effects Gary Rydstrom had done for the ride. It was like finding a treasure. Despite my West Coast Disney snobbery, I did visit the Orlando parks in 2002 and again in 2013 and really enjoyed the larger Star Wars presence. Again, despite being in a different type of park, Hollywood Studios, the attractions and cast members felt right. Last year, I ran the Disneyland Half Marathon and I got a great shot with Vader and two troopers. I told them it was good to be with the 500 first, and that earned me a nice pat on the back and appreciation. And again, despite seeing Mary Poppins next, this just felt right. I was actually in Disneyland when Thomas Riddle from Star Wars in the Classroom texted me to tell me Lucasfilm had been bought. So for me, where Disney has been about retelling classic stories and making them relevant to kids and their families, Star Wars is the invented myths and now classic stories. I actually think... One thing that bothers fans about changes to the classic trilogy is that we want the stories to feel as old and set as Grimm's fairy tales. So having Star Wars as a permanent fixture in the parks actually fills this need. It makes it 3D, real, tangible. I suspect when we get to board a life-size Falcon, our brains may melt in amazement and excitement. I wonder what I might say first. Should we get us out of here? You came in that thing? Fastest hunk of junk in the galaxy. Because I do know that I will feel even closer than Star Wars and Star Tours because I do know that I will feel even closer than Star Tours makes me feel right now. And that will be awesome. I will get to enter the galaxy far, far away. Until then, I'm thrilled to be running the first Rebels Challenge in January, a 10K run on Saturday and a a half marathon on Sunday, 19.3 miles over two days, all in Star Wars glory. 
That's from Laird Malvin. Well, Laird, first off, best of luck on the run. I know you're a big runner, and so I look forward to hearing your reactions and thoughts to that incredible experience. But that's pretty cool. Um, I've been to Disneyland uh, three times. Uh, I'm hoping to peek in when we go to Celebration Anaheim. But it's pretty, pretty fun, the idea, the notion, again, of uh, what Disney can possibly do um, with the Star Wars theme parks presence at Disneyland, at Disney World, all over the place. A lot of exciting things happening. I think also, too, like we talked about on the on the podcast, is I think Disney has plans to, to do stuff. I mean, if they're still in the works. I think a life-size Falcon is, like we have always kind of talked about, it'll be the centerpiece uh, to be able to have fans walk through and enjoy and just relive scenes and uh, just just geek out a little bit. Um, and, and again, I... A little like, bit? Aren't you going to, like, explode? <laughs> <laughs> I will. I'll be like hiding in the smuggling compartments and screaming, and it'll yeah, be fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gr- great kid. Don't get cocky. <laughs> our next email comes from uh, Jay Krebs, our one of our great bloggers for our website, and she says, "Hey guys, wondering if Coffee Kenobi t-shirts are still available. Actually, being summer, I'm more interested in a nice tank top. Is there some on the way I can order one? Thanks, uh, Jay Krebs. Uh, she's a great blogger. Check out her blogs on our website." Coffee with Kenobi dot com, and again, we are still in the works of putting together some some merchandising as far as Coffee with Kenobi goes, and you never know what will come out next. And what a nice compliment too that uh, the logo you designed has gotten such great feedback, and I certainly want to get a T shirt of it too. So certainly um, keep your eyes open to Coffee with Kenobi dot com and our Facebook and Twitter feeds, and hopefully we'll have some exciting news for you very soon. Our last email comes from Chris Baca, and he writes, You guys might find this interesting. The church my sister goes to in Webster, Texas, is doing a sermon series this summer using movies that the congregation picked. The first sermon used Star Wars to discuss good and evil and some differences on Christian teaching and the Force. I wish you knew about this earlier. I would have made sure to have visited that weekend that they did. At least they released them as podcasts, and there's a link that he provides. So not only can Star Wars be used in school, they can be used to teach a spiritual message as well. And that's from Chris Baca. Well, thanks, Chris. That's really, really cool. I cannot wait to check that out. I very much believe in the notion of Star Wars incorporating a spiritual message. I mean, the Force is a spiritual entity. There's no denying that. So really, really cool that Star Wars can reach so many different people in so many different ways. So thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, and again, I'm blown away how, how much Star Wars is touched you know, just by pop culture and just, um, just you know, religious beliefs, and anybody in any walk of life can kind of, you know, use it in their their daily walk as far as uh, just being a better person and and fighting fighting evil, if you will. Um, I mean, it's we see it countless ways as far as um, just using it and like we talked about different applications of of, of pop culture and. TV shows and books and media. And so it's just, just one more way that shows how much fandom has reached out and uh, how much the Star Wars is involved in our lives. Loved hearing that you guys were going to have Ian Desher back on the show. The first time you had Ian on the show, I had the pleasure of finding out about William Shakespeare's Star Wars. I have since read that and The Empire Striketh Back. And I got to tell you that it was an amazing experience reading both books. They are not only hilarious, but they are incredibly insightful into character motivation and some interesting plot twists that you may not have thought of. Uh, Enjoyed my time interacting with Ian, uh, not only on Twitter and Facebook, but also had the great pleasure of having him speak to all three of my sixth grade classes Uh, via FaceTime, and Ian was incredibly gracious, spent a significant amount of time with each of the classes, and even did a QA and a for each of them, and it was a great time for all of us, and uh, I just wish him continued success, and thank you so much for the books, Ian. Well, thanks, Frank, as always, for that MP3. I agree with you. Ian is an awesome guy, a stand-up guy. When he came into my classrooms, too, he did some Q&A as well, and the amount of time he puts into sharing uh, the educational value of William Shakespeare's Star Wars and just the passion he has for the Star Wars community and just for people in general. 
uh, making make him someone that even if you're not a Star Wars fan, I would think you want to check out uh, what people like Ian are doing because they really are contributing to the culture in a positive way. And I know that I'm biased because we've become <laughs> friends through this whole thing and I love Star Wars and Shakespeare, but um, Craig has some great points. Absolutely. And I mean, I know you're biased and we're all biased about all our guests, I think, too. Um, Probably. And anybody in fandom, I think that it's something to share. Uh, like you said, Ian Desher's work um, is really, truly remarkable because it's something unique and, and something put out there for fans for, like I said, uh, both, both Shakespeare and Star Wars are kind of the mixture of both. And, um, you know, I'm not necessarily a huge uh, uh, Shakespeare fan, but, you know, I can still enjoy it with, with my kids and be able to enjoy his, his craft and his uh, his project and anything that everybody has to share, I can certainly enjoy because I just come from the standpoint of, of just enjoying Star Wars. So I think that, you know, Craig has some good comments as far as, you know, him sharing it with the classroom. What a great way to spend time and, and be able to influence young minds. Chewie, get us out of here! If you would like to respond to our question of the show, have a comment, or just want to say hello, send us an email or mp3 at feedback at coughwithkenobi.com. Or if you have a specific question or comment for either of us individually, email us at danz at coughwithkenobi.com or coreyc at coughwithkenobi.com or visit us at coughwithkenobi.com and click on the Contact Us section or comment on one of the stories featured on the site. If you enjoy the show, please write a review on iTunes. You can also like the show on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash coughwithkenobi as well as keep up to date on our Twitter feed at twitter.com forward slash coughwithkenobi. You can also find us on Tumblr at coughwithkenobi.tumblr.com. If you enjoy the jazz music, download the album Eye to Eye by Steve Torok on iTunes. Give the evacuation code signal. That's it for show number 22 of Coffee with Kenobi. A big thank you to Ian Desher for having a cup of coffee with us and for discussing the Jedi Doth Return. Be sure to check out this amazing series and be sure to also check out how you can purchase the book in our show notes. Thanks to Rob for the Bearded Trio and to everyone who contributed to our show, to all of you out there who listened to an email, Coffee with Kenobi. Don't forget to send us your comments and opinions on the topic for show number 23, Star Wars Rebels with Adam Beret. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. There's no one here.